Hi, friends, and welcome to Art Lab, the podcast for folks who want to make creative work but really feel like they should get the dishes done first. Does this ever happen to you? You have an unexpected window of free time and you decide to do your creative work. And then just as you're getting started, you remember all of the things, the laundry, the yard, calling your mom back, replying to those emails, whatever it is, you remember that you have to get that necessary thing done before spending time on your creative work. Or if you're like me, maybe you sometimes feel it on kind of a cosmic level too. Like there are people suffering, there's injustice, the world is full of pain and brokenness. What am I doing spending time on art making? Does any of this even matter? Today, we're gonna dive right into this. We're gonna talk about feeling guilty for making art or feeling guilty for wanting to make art or for spending time on creative experimentation that may lead to dead ends or for the choices that you make while you're in your creative practice. Basically, we're going to talk about what happens when art and guilt collide, and we're going to explore some concrete tools and practices that you can use to keep making your creative work, even amidst that uncomfortable collision. So first up, let's acknowledge that guilt is a word that has some pretty specific connotations, and depending on the background that you come from, you may or may not identify with it, or even describe yourself as somebody who struggles with feeling guilty related to your creative practice. But I am guessing that a lot of us probably can identify with struggling with decisions between things that feel necessary and urgent and things that feel you know, frivolous or extra. And art, creativity in general, is often grouped in with that latter category, with the extras and add-ons of life. It's a thing to do when all the important stuff is done. It's dessert. It's not the main course. And even if you're someone who has found a way to kind of, you know, plug your creativity into an accepted structure or form, you know, maybe like a full-time commercial artist of some kind on the one end, you know, where that, that creativity generates income or a quiet, you know, weekend hobby on the other end, even if you've managed to do that, even if you've managed to plug into, you know, one end of that spectrum of acceptable versions of creativity, there always still is this tension or, you know, a kind of felt separation between creative work and everything else all of the practical bits of life. And while it probably wasn't always this way, you know, people have been making art for tens of thousands of years after all, the world we live in today tends to separate and force distinction and assign value, even when in reality things may be a lot more mysterious and entangled and overlapping. And whether we like it or not, we are all powerfully conditioned by this culture that we live in to do that same kind of categorization and value assigning and to prioritize actions that fit in those higher value categories, which we all know are the ones that make money, you know, a job or support some kind of a social need like having a house, taking care of a family, things like that. And actions that don't easily fit in those categories or worse that disrupt those categories can be flagged as selfish or foolish and practical wastes of time. Time. And it makes perfect sense then that for many folks, spending time on creative work is a natural precipitant for feelings of guilt because creativity necessarily requires a lot of non-productive space. It demands time wasting. And even if like me, your creativity is tightly connected to your job and the way that you earn a living, this tension still comes up because there are some kinds of art making or you know art adjacent activities that are objectively more productive. Client work, retail art sales, strategic portfolio pieces, even social media posts. You know, I, I never feel guilty for spending time on any of those things because those things are productive. But if I want to mess around and make paintings that aren't aimed at anything strategic, or if I want to make work that's open-ended and, you know, maybe not commercially viable in any way, if I want to explore something that may turn out to be a total rabbit trail or a failure like this podcast, <laughs> then I can almost guarantee that guilt will come up. And all of this hasn't even touched on the experience of folks who not only swim in those same cultural waters that we all do, the cultural waters that systematically undervalue creativity, but who also have loved ones in their lives that overtly disparage art and creativity, you know, call it a silly navel-gazing pursuit for selfish and practical people. So ultimately... While there is undoubtedly a spectrum, just as there is with any challenging emotion, I think whether we make a living from our creativity or not, we can all end up facing similar kinds of dilemmas here. You know, we have to choose whether we're willing to spend time with our creativity, even when it feels silly or unproductive or frivolous, even when it makes us feel guilty or triggers our shame. 
Now, I think we've established the problem that we're facing, the emotional landscape that we're in pretty well here at this point. And as we transition to talking about potential ways to tackle it, potential things to experiment with, there is a part of me that really wants to explain how and why I believe that creativity is not frivolous, but vital. And I could list off all the arguments I know for why this is true and cite all the people who are smarter and more experienced than I am who have already made those arguments over the years. But if you are anything like me, that won't actually help you when you're down to struggling with the difficult feelings in the moment. Yes, it can be validating to hear them, but changing your mind about something, opening up a new perspective, unfortunately doesn't always change the way you feel or the way you act. When you go to sit down to play your music or to write your play or to draw or to paint or to sign up for improv classes, whatever it is, those feelings of guilt will probably come right back up no matter how much you've attempted to shift your mindset or your consciously held views. So instead of doing that, instead of listing out all those arguments and trying to change your mind, I'm going to assume that you already do believe at some level that creativity is valuable, even if you struggle with feelings of guilt in the moment when you're engaged in your creative practice. So instead Instead of trying to give you that argument, we are just going to get right into the specific actions that you can try, some concrete tools that you can experiment with in those moments when you're struggling with guilt or shame so that you can keep moving in your creative work and stay engaged in your process, even when you're in the middle of those uncomfortable emotions. Okay, so we're going to talk about three concrete actions to try if you're struggling with feelings of guilt or shame when you make your creative work. Now, I'm going to give a little disclaimer here, which is just this. I am a regular creative person just like you. I'm not a mental health professional, and I do not have all the answers. What I'm about to share are just some practices that have helped me, and I'm hoping that some aspect of them might help you. There's no one right way to tackle any of these things, and you are the only one who can decide what works for your unique situation. So if something I say connects for you, give it a try and experiment with it. And if not, just let it go. All right, let's dig in. So this first action is so basic that I'm not even going to give it a name. I'm just going to say this. If you are someone who struggles with feelings of guilt or shame when you make your creative work, or honestly with any challenging feelings at all related to your creative practice, please do whatever you can to get plugged into a community of peers. Find just at least one other person who is pursuing some kind of creative work who also struggles with some of these feelings. They don't need to live nearby. They don't necessarily even need to make the same kind of creative work as you, though you know, being in a similar sphere can be helpful. The main criteria here is that they are also just actively, regularly trying to make creative work and dealing with some kind of emotional challenges around it, which, you know, is basically everybody. (laughs) So you are looking for somebody who's on a parallel journey, who's grappling with, you know, their own emotional nemesis. You know, maybe it's a similar one to yours or a different version of it, but, but whatever it is, they're fighting that fight regularly and they're still showing up to make their creative work. Now, this is a good thing to do regardless of what you struggle with within your art making, whether you're somebody who deals with guilt and shame or not. And it's especially vital if you're an isolated creative, you know, someone who hasn't gotten to spend a lot of time around other creative people, just having a regular connection with other folks who are consistently pursuing their own creative practice and their own art making is so helpful. Now, unfortunately, there's no step-by-step for finding these folks, but I can tell you how I did it. I first made friends with other creative people, pretty much all online, who seemed to be at a similar stage to me in their practice. And eventually, after commenting back and forth on each other's work for a while, sending DMs, maybe even emails, I eventually asked a few of them if they would be open to actually talking art and creativity sometime on the phone, like, you know, with our voices. (laughs) And did it feel cringy to do that in the moment? Of course. And once some of the folks who I asked said no. Did it make my social anxiety flare up and remind me of feeling like an awkward rejected 17 year old? Yes, you know it did. But it was worth it because some of them said yes. And now after a few years of actively building those friendships, I can confidently say that it has had a massive impact on my ability to keep growing creatively, to keep trying new things that feel risky or impractical or uncertain. I don't think I would even be making this podcast if I hadn't been connected to those people. And I know that at a baseline level for me, I am the bravest, most committed, most open-hearted version of myself when I'm connected to others who are on the path with me. 
yeah, this isn't revolutionary. But in art making, because the thing itself is so often done in solitude, it's easy to forget that we still desperately need others. And not just in a you know basic utilitarian way, like needing others to show you how to solve a particular problem, though you know that can happen too. But in a more open-ended, almost mysterious way, we need the connection itself, the community itself. And I'm not really one to dwell on regrets. It's not an emotion that I experience a lot of. But one regret I definitely do have is that I didn't put more time into cultivating those kinds of friendships from the jump. Back then, I thought those kinds of friendships were just like, you know, a nice thing to have. They were kind of an add on, but not an absolutely crucial necessity for my ability to maintain a thriving creative practice. My mindset at the time was that, you know, I could just figure this out on my own. And then once I had arrived, whatever that means, I could connect with other artists who had also arrived. And while I did take this solo approach for a while, and obviously, you know, it, I was able to kind of get things moving and get going on my own. I really came to a point where I couldn't go any further. I couldn't even point to anything concrete. I just knew that I couldn't get any further on my own. And I think looking back, I'm pretty confident that if I had put more effort into building those deep, real connections with other creative people from the beginning, things would have been faster and easier. And, you know, at the very least, even if they weren't faster and easier, they would have been less lonely. So the baseline here is this, whatever you are struggling with creatively, having a community of people who are also in that struggle and making their own creative work anyway, will make all the difference. All right. So next up is my super versatile favorite two-part tool to use whenever I'm stuck on literally anything make it easier and do it more. And if this sounds familiar, it's because it's the basis for how we tackled roadblocks in the last episode when we talked about common stuck places for creative folks. And while I don't want to be redundant, it's definitely applicable here too. So uh, just as a refresher, make it easier can mean literally anything that will make the creative process easier to get into. So you could make it easier to start on. You know, you have your setup ready to go. You're going to use materials that you already have on hand. You could have a time especially blocked off in your calendar so you're not deciding in the moment whether you're going to engage in your creative practice or not. And another approach for making it easier could just be making it shorter, which means that you spend less time engaging in your creative process. And as a result, less time exposed to those uncomfortable feelings, whether it's guilt or shame or, you know, some other feeling that comes up for you. And if your experience does include those feelings, if it does include feelings of guilt or shame when you're attempting to make creative work, you know how very tempting it can be in the moment to try to either fight or flee from those emotions, to either argue against them or avoid them entirely. But unfortunately, both of these approaches can be ineffective in their own ways. And we'll talk about why argument against feelings of guilt or shame can be ineffective in the next section. But for now, we're just going to tackle avoidance. And it's pretty straightforward because avoiding feelings of guilt can often just mean that you also avoid doing the things that matter to you, like making art. So we really can't just wait for those feelings to go away. As nice as that would be, we have to get used to making the work even when those feelings are around, which is challenging and uncomfortable to do. So making the work easier, making the actual creative practice itself easier can really help if you struggle with avoidance. So think about it like this. If you're someone who has a really low tolerance for spiciness, but you want to eat spicy food, you need to start small, you know, just a drop or two of hot sauce. So if guilt is the hot sauce in this analogy, um, which I'm a little bit torn about because I do genuinely love hot sauce. But anyway, if guilt is the hot sauce in this analogy and imagining spending 30 minutes on your creative work has you sweating, if that is just too spicy for you, if it's so spicy that you never even start on it, if you're just avoiding completely, try making art for just 10 minutes. Aim for more sessions of your creative practice, for more individual exposures to the spiciness, even if they're short exposures, small exposures, rather than for higher amounts of spiciness in one sitting. So do that for a week and then see if you can handle more. And if on the other hand, you're trying this smaller dose and you notice that some of the time you're still avoiding your creative practice because it's just too spicy, it's too uncomfortable, even in those smaller blocks, maybe you need to dial down the spiciness even further. Maybe you need it milder, you know, shorter periods of time, easier concepts, whatever it is, that's fine. The most important thing is to keep doing it, to keep taking those actions, to keep making your creative work, which is the second half of that two-part versatile tool. Make it easier, do it more. It's by doing it more. It's by spending more time around those uncomfortable feelings, around that spiciness, that it eventually becomes less uncomfortable. Whatever amount you're starting with, you will get used to that amount of hot sauce and then eventually be ready for more. 
Now, the third and final practice that we're going to talk about today is called diffusion. Diffusion is a technique from ACT, which stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And ACT is a treatment modality that shares some similarities to cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, you know, I, I think a little bit more common. More people have heard of that. But what diffusion does is it's a practice that's used to create distance between you and your thoughts and emotions. I first heard about this practice in a book called The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris, which I highly recommend, and I'll put it in the show notes. For me, this technique, diffusion, has been incredibly helpful in many areas of life, not just in creativity, but we're going to focus, of course, on its application in creativity today, since that's what we're here to talk about. Now, earlier on in the episode, we were chatting about a tendency that many of us have when experiencing uncomfortable emotions like guilt or shame, which is to try to avoid them or argue our way around them. Now, we already unpacked some of the reasons why avoidance can cause problems, but argument can be just as ineffective. For example, if you've ever had a thought like, I'm selfish for wanting to spend time making art, or this is a waste of time and I should do something more productive, it's pretty natural to respond with, no, it's not selfish, or it's a great way to spend my time, or some other you know, positive affirmation to counter that negative thought. And for some, that really may do the trick. If that works for you, if internally reminding yourself of the right counterpoint silences that gnawing voice inside and allows you to just go ahead and make your creative work, that's great and you should keep on doing that. But for others, in certain situations, that kind of mental litigation doesn't do a lot to help because many of us, especially those of us who, you know, tend to maybe overthink or experience anxiety, can be really good at arguing against ourselves. It doesn't really matter what line of reasoning you introduce. Your brain is one step ahead with the counterpoint. And for me, in those moments, even though it may feel like I'm, you know, thinking my way through this rationally, what really happens is that I'm getting swept away by my feelings. And when this happens, when we get swept away by the story our feelings are telling, it can make it really difficult to take the kinds of action that will actually lead you where you want to go. So what can we do instead? What does diffusion look like? The first step is to notice the uncomfortable feelings and then to try to identify the thought that's behind those feelings. When I do this with my six-year-old, we call it noticing the channel that your brain TV is stuck on. And, And I'm pretty sure that Russ Harris came up with the TV analogy, so I can't take credit for that, but it does work really well. So for right now, let's just imagine a brain TV that's stuck on the I'm selfish for wanting to make art channel. So rather than pushing back against that thought with all of the amazing counterpoints that I'm sure you can think of right now, just notice it. Notice that thought. I'm selfish for wanting to make art. Don't engage with it. Don't argue with it. Whether the thought is true or not is not important right now. Just notice it. I'm selfish for wanting to make art. Then to take the first step in separating yourself from that thought, in defusing yourself from that thought, make a little verbal distance between you and that thought by saying either in your mind or out loud, I'm having the thought that I'm selfish for wanting to make art. I'm having the thought is the key addition here as it contextualizes I'm selfish for wanting to make art as exactly what it is, a thought, a brain channel. It's not a fact, it's just a feeling. Do that a few times, say it over and over. I'm having the thought that I'm selfish for wanting to make art. Then create a little more distance by saying, I notice that my brain is having the thought that I'm selfish for wanting to make art. Now you're not only contextualizing and naming the thought, calling it out for what it is, but you're placing yourself in the role of a neutral observer. You're no longer inside the I'm selfish for wanting to make art brain channel. You're just noticing that that's the channel your mind TV is stuck on right now. Again, repeat this several times. I notice that my brain is having the thought that I'm selfish for wanting to make art. I personally really do find it helpful to say it out loud. So if it's possible, you know, if you need to go to another room or another place to make that possible, try to do that. And for me, going through this sequence, saying each of these things out loud, even if it's quietly, is often enough to detach myself from those very sticky feelings so that I can get moving again. But if you find that even after going through those steps, the feelings of guilt are still overwhelming and you're still stuck on that I'm selfish for wanting to make art mind channel, try those same steps, but this time add another layer. Once you get to the, I noticed that my brain is having the thought that I'm selfish for wanting to make art phase, instead of just saying it out loud, sing it, sing it to the tune of something like Twinkle Twinkle or Happy Birthday or Mary Had a Little Lamb. And I'm not going to do that for you right now because I want you to leave this podcast on. But even though I know that that sounds ridiculous, 
please give it a try before you totally write it off. I know that when I first read about this practice in the happiness trap, you know, the whole thing, I actually laughed out loud because it seems so childish and gimmicky to me. But then the first time I tried it, I, I decided to give it a try anyway. And I tried it on one of my most uncomfortable, paralyzing thoughts that actually really has nothing to do with art. And it was a thought that I would typically get stuck on or in rather for hours or days at a time while I would attempt to figure out how to argue against it or find a way to disprove it. But the first time I tried this technique, I was able to detach to, to defuse from that thought within just a few minutes. And while I still experienced the negative feelings, they, they were still there. They didn't impact my actions or the choices I made in the way that they normally would have. And that's what I find so helpful about this practice. It does not make the hard feelings go away. They may never fully go away, unfortunately. But once you're defused from them, they don't feel so all consuming. It's the difference between being trapped inside the TV channel and having the TV on, you know, in the corner of the room. It's still there, but you're not stuck inside it, which can make it actually possible to funnel the energy that you'd usually put into arguing against it or avoiding it right into taking action on your creative process. So if you have been struggling with guilt or shame or honestly, any other challenging emotions when you attempt to make your creative work, here's something you can experiment with this week. Identify one action that you can take in your creative practice that will likely bring bring up that uncomfortable feeling, whatever it is for you. Maybe it's pursuing something totally open-ended that has no immediate prospect for making money. Maybe it's just the choice to spend any time at all in creative practice when you have other things in your life that are clamoring for your attention. Whatever it is, first things first, make it easier and do it more. Constrain it in a way that will make it more approachable and spend more time in it, even in small doses. And then when the hard feelings come up in the moment, as they inevitably will, don't try to outthink them or run away from them or push them down. And most importantly, don't bail on the creative action that you're taking. Try some diffusion to create a little distance between yourself and those thoughts. And if you can, whatever you are struggling with, wherever you're at right now, start thinking about how you can connect with another creative person, at least one other creative person who is in a similar spot to you tackling similar challenges. And if you like to share your process on social media and you end up trying any of these tools out this week, tag me. I'm at Kendall Hilligus. Even if what you share is messy or incomplete, I love, love, love seeing what you're working on. And if you found this episode of Art Lab helpful, please do share it with a friend or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you for spending time with me and I will see you next week. Bye.